It's like my Aunt Agnes always said, it's better to lose your love at first sight than to lose your date on a blind glass. <laughs> The, the legendary Rosemary today on Pop Goes the Culture. Hi, I'm David Levin, and welcome to another understated episode of Pop Goes the Culture. Today, the conclusion to my conversation with Rosemary as we talk about the Dick Van Dyke Show and her relationship with Mary Tyler Moore, her favorite episodes and what happened when that show came to an end. We even have a surprise guest show up in the studio before we finished our talk. So I get a call one day, and the voice says, uh, they want you over at the Dizzy Lou, see Danny Thomas. It's, oh, God, I got the guest shot. She says, no, this is for a new show called The Dick Van Dyke Show. I said, what's a Dick Van Dyke? She said, just go over there. So I go over there, and I meet Carl Reiner. And Sheldon said, if you want the best, there she is, which was thrilling for me. And Carl said, I heard you were just wonderful. I said, I hope so. They gave me a script. Sheldon said, you don't have to read. You got the part. I said, who's playing the third part, the third day, uh, writer? We haven't found them yet. I said, what about Maury Amsterdam? I said, he was a writer. He used to write for Fanny Bryce and Fred Allen and people like that. I said, he does comedy now. I said, he knows every joke. He's a writer. You know, Where is he? He lives in Yonkers, New York. Here's his phone number. We're very close. I've known Maury since I was nine years old, you know. I've known everybody since I was eight, nine years old, you know. So I came home and I called him up. I said, they're going to call you about a new show called The Dick Van Dyke Show. He says, what's a Dick Van Dyke? I said, you come out here. It's a new show. I think we got a new show. So he comes and says, I'll be out Monday. Comes out, he got the part. And that's how we did The Dick Van Dyke Show. That's how we got started. How did you find out what a Dick Van Dyke was? Day I met him. What you, would you think? Very sweet, naive, very wide open eyes and holy cow, this is Hollywood. Wow, I'm I'm doing television, you know. He's the most talented man I've ever known. Uh, I don't think he knows how much talent he has. He's so natural, he's so, he's wonderful, he really is. And, and, and very much, I don't want to say alone, I don't mean that, uh, we do the we'd rehearse and he'd be sitting in the corner doodling, drawing Mr. Schmitz and things like that, you know. And they'd say, Okay, Dick, and he'd get up and do his you know, then he'd do something and we'd all laugh and he'd say, Is that funny? I said, Yeah, leave it in, you know. And that's the way we you know I I adore Dick. He's the most easiest man to work with and very kind and very gentle. How about Mary? Mary and I never got along too well. Uh, Mary, Mary was, um, she, she was, first there was me, then there was Maury, then there was Zeke, and then there was the kid, and Mary was the last, because they couldn't find anybody. And she came in, and she was, all right, you know, and Carl said, she's the one. So, uh, Mary came in the first day and said, I'm going to wind up with my own production company, MTM. I'm going to have a kitty cat for this and that. And I said, boy, that's ambition, you know. So for some reason or other, we were very friendly. I mean, there was no arguments, no no nothing, no anything like that. We just didn't match, you know. I mean, I would say, I love the blouse. She said, yeah, I got it at Saks. And that was it, you know. Uh, I never got to be very friendly with it. And I told my husband, I said, we're both married. We both have a child. We're on the same show. Why don't we, you know, get closer? Because there aren't too many people I don't get along with. I get along with everybody, you know. And he said, she's on another direction. She's worried about her career. You're not. 
So don't don't think anything about it. He said she's a nice, wonderful person. She just has her eyes set on her career and wants to, you know. I said, well, that's fine, but you know. So we never really got along. We got along when we did the reunion show, and I looked at her and I said, we've lost a lot of years, Mary. She says, yeah, I know. I said that it was silly. I said I think I was jealous. She says I think I was too. You know, and I said. You were younger than I was. You were thinner than I was. You were more beautiful than I was. Why shouldn't I be jealous? You know, she says, "Yeah, I know." And we hugged and kissed, and everything is fine. That's good. Yeah, she's 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 a very sick girl, but she's a uh, she's a trooper. She's good. She really is very good and very sweet. I like and that. And we're good friends. I like happy endings. Well, you got one. At this point in the conversation, we took a quick break because one of Rosemary's co-stars from The Dick Van Dyke Show came by to say hi. Larry Matthews, who played Richie Petri, Rob and Laura's son. Oh, Larry, my baby. Mm, hi, sweetie. Gracious. Oh, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? You going to do this thing? Yeah, I'm ready Get to ready to be here a long time. <laughs> I'm looking. I, I realize that. I might not get back to work today. <laughs> Okie dokie. Okay, where were we? 1931? No, 1961. <laughs> no, we're in only 61 now. <laughs> we're up to 1961. Tell me about the kid on the show. Larry? Oh, pain in the butt. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I te I, I, he just came in, so I'm teasing. Larry, Larry was like my, my child. And he thinks of me as his mother when we were working, because we were always playing games and having fun, and you know. And uh, I love him. We both have the same birthday, August the fifteenth. Love the Leos. Huh? Love the Leos. Yeah, we're Leos, all right. <laughs> no, he's very, very good, and uh, he was very good on the show, and uh, very easy to get along with. We had a very workable group. We had people that cared for one another, you know. We really did. How about Richard Deacon? Oh, I loved him. I loved him dearly. He was like an older brother to me. And I would go to him and say, why, why, why are they doing that? You know? And he, that was one thing that was wonderful. I could go to Larry, the kid, and I would say, I wouldn't say that like that. Say it this way. And he'd say, OK. And he would go do it. And Richard Deacon would come to me and say, I think if you said it this way, it might be a little bit better. And I said, he says, try it. So nobody got mad that, that they were telling you what to do. You know, that, that's what was so wonderful about it. Everybody was, let's just make it a good one. Um, the show was supposed to be a reflection of Carl Reiner's life. I don't know. I don't live with him. That's what he said. Well, your part was supposedly based on on a couple of a couple of women writers from. I think I think he he fashioned me after Selma Diamond. But uh, I don't know whether she was uh, looking for a guy, or not. He made me looking for a guy all the time. Did you ever meet Selma Diamond during that period? No, she was gone by then. I think. Uh, she she lived. She was a while longer. Yeah. She was like no, I never met her. Okay. Um, but what, the atmosphere on the set, basically freewheeling, working. Well, we had Lucille Ball next door, and we had Joey Bishop all doing shows, and they would come in our, our stage and say, what the hell are you all laughing about? What's going on here? And then Maury would say, be quiet. This is a comedy show, you know? <laughs> and But we had people say, what, why? All we hear is laughter over here. Because we had a hell of a good time. Um, what were some of your favorite episodes? The ones I was in, of course. Uh, my birthday, my birthday episode was a good one. Uh, the birth of the baby is a good one. Uh, they're all good, but I mean, favorites, you know. Um, let's see. God, uh, the Christmas shows were wonderful. The Christmas shows, because we sang and we, we did this. And uh, and Dick did so many things in each show. It's hard to to uh, pick one, you know. We did the show called The Musicians. Remember that? That was a good show. 
about the Walnut episode? Oh, yeah, the Walnut show was a very popular show. That was very funny because we used to do a reading <laughs> in the Christian Science reading room, Maury said, and we used to do the, the script of next week to read, and it was the Walnut show. And we laughed and we kidded around with it. And Sheldon used to be there, and Sheldon said, what do you think, Dick? Dick says, I think it's cute, it's kind of funny. What do you think, Mary? Mary says, I think it's nice. We've never done one like that. I think it's wonderful. He says, I think it stinks. Good luck. And he walked out. And we all went, he's never done that before. So Carl said, what do you all think? He said, we think it's a hell of a show. So we did, we rehearsed and we did the show. And then fr Friday night, he would come in and we'd do sort of a rough run through. And I've always said this about Sheldon. He was a big man. Uh, in, in generalities of, of being a person, in front of everybody, he said, I was wrong. I made a mistake. This is a very funny show. I apologize. And then walked out. It was hysterical. Stands the test. It, yeah, but that takes a big man to do that. Absolutely. In front of a whole company. Absolutely. The, um, the show was shot in front of an audience? Yes. Did you sort of... Tell me about what that was, what the atmosphere was like. I, I understand that you would sometimes do the warm-up for the audience. No, I never did warm-ups. Uh, the show, we would we would start at 11.30, and everybody would be introduced. And then we'd do the first scene. And then when we change for camera floating or change of clothes, Maury and I used to go in front of the audience and keep them going, or Carl would come out and do jokes. and and do bits, you know, anything, and talk to you know, to keep that spirit up, you know. Right, that's, because that's something that people who watch the show would not know. I mean, that would be, like, classic to see something like that. Today. Yeah, it would be. We had some funny things, because Maury had a, had a bit, we used to call him the human joke machine, and he'd say, give me a subject, and he'd say, watermelon, and he'd give you a joke about a watermelon, just like that. And one time a guy said, uh, Canada. And Maury looked at me and I said, oh, you're stuck. He says, no. He said, an uncle once went up to Canada and tried to drink it dry, didn't do it. And I said, no good, Maury. <laughs> but he, he came up with jokes all the time. That's amazing. That's amazing. It was a very happy group. It was, today they say it's a, it's a, a, a we get along well, it's this, it's that. It was nothing like that, that, like what we had. We had our own little group of things and, that we did and, 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 and things that were ours, you know? And it was, a, it was really a family. When my husband passed away, the whole cast came over my house that night. You were thinking about leaving? Huh? Were you thinking, I heard you were thought about, I read that you thought about leaving the show. The yes. Uh, when he passed away in 64, uh, we had one more year to go because uh, Dick thought we were getting dry and didn't want to do any more. We never did a show in color. And Sheldon used to say that they would ba back up the Brinks truck if he, if he asked for it. He says, I don't know why he wants to quit. Two more years in color would be, you know. But Carl and he decided that five years was enough. So, um, what, what was I talking about? That when your husband passed away. Oh, so my husband passed away in 64. And we never expected that he was 48 years old. And uh, the whole cast came over that night to my house and uh, sat with me and all this and all that, you know, what, what they do when they do that. Now, I said I didn't want to do the show anymore. I said, I can't. I've lost my voice. I can't sing. I can't do this. I can't, I can't be funny. I can't think of anything to do or be loose like I was before. So John Rich, director, came over my house about 8 o'clock. And he says, can we talk? I said, sure. Sat down. My mother was living with me then. And uh, she went in and made coffee and all this. And, he said, don't leave the show. You got one more year to go, don't leave it. You realize, what, what are you gonna do if you leave? I said, I don't care, I'm not gonna work anymore. I'm finished, I'm over. 
He said, don't say that because you've got a lot going and so forth and so on. And if you leave the show, it's no good for the show. It's no good for you. I don't give a goddamn for the show. You know, I'm, I was in that frame of mind. I said, I can't think. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I, I sort of lost my voice, you know, and uh, I said, I don't want to do it. So anyway, he stayed till one o'clock in the morning. And he finally said, have I convinced you to stay? And I said, yeah, I guess so. And my mother said, what do you think it's about time you went home? <laughs> and he said, yeah. He says, have I convinced you? And I said, yeah, I think so. Said, then I've done my job. And he walked out. Wow. That's, that's what I'm saying about friendships and stuff with that show. It's never stopped. Larry, the kid, I, 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 we always call him the kid. We have the birthdays the same day. We keep sending cards to one another. We see one another every once in a while. When Mary comes in town, I see her. We see one another. We, we gather. If there's a gathering of the Dick Van Dyke show, we're all together again. It's, it's, not, it's not just a cast that came and went. You know, it's still, and it's been voted the legendary show of, of, of all television. I mean, it's, it's, it's history, that show. That show will never die, never, it'll always be there. And it's a legendary show. It was awarded that. The, um, what was it like doing the reunion show? Oh, fantastic. It's like that old joke, two guys that see one another, haven't seen it for 20 years, and one guy said, as I was saying, you know, it was one of those things. We just picked up. We just, it was like we worked yesterday. And we came in and went to work again, you know. It was just, it was wonderful. We had a wonderful time. The period of uh, the show, which was of a certain era, and it started around the Kennedy era, <laughs> And, and then Kennedy obviously was shot. We, what, were you guys shooting at the time? What was going we on? We were reading a script at the time, uh, next week's script, like as we did. And our prop man came out and said, the president's been shot. We said, funny. Oh, Christ, that's not funny. And we all ran into the prop room, and the radio was on, and they were talking about Kennedy being shot. And I, I, I think we all, we all went in a stupor. We all just looked at one another, and we listened till he passed away, and then we went back into where we were. And Carl says, "Let's go home," and we went home. And we didn't shoot that week. We shot the following week, because nobody could get with it. You know what? I've spoken to many. Uh, Many people, especially you know, with 9/11, I spoke to some people. How do you go back to work after something like that happens? I mean, does, is it difficult? Is yes, it it? it's difficult, but it's the same thing after my husband died. I mean, Deke, when Richard Deacon went around telling everybody, "Don't talk about it. Let her talk about it. Don't put your arm around her. Whatever she says is fine. You know, leave her alone. Don't you know." You, you go on. You, you have to go on. It's like, uh, it's like life, no matter what. Ha I, I wrote a book, I told you, and I wrote a chapter called Life is a Three-Legged Chair. You never have all of it. There's always something missing, and that gives you the reason to go on. You have to go on because there's more for you. You're not done yet. So... There, I, I, I watch different shows and different biographies of people, and some of the people I think, oh my God, they're wealthy, they're famous. They're, they're, they've had so much heartache, yeah. so much sickness, so much loss of people and children and things. So nobody really has it all. You can't have it all, because if you had it all, they'd have no place to go. So you should carry around a phone book with you for the extra chair leg all the time? No? Okay. It's a good thing I'm on this side. <laughs> You'll get me later. <laughs> Drink Canada Dry. Yeah, okay. I'm there can't be any more that you want to know. No, there's not that much more. There's oh, more I'm exhausted. Uh,
my whole life story. I know. You, you and uh, you and Maury uh, um, teamed up again for another sitcom where you played husband and wife. I'm trying to remember what that was. But Honeymoon was, Hotel. Was that what it was? How was that? That was a show that uh, was supposed to be a spinoff for us. Uh, we made it at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And uh, we did three shows and uh, didn't work. And then years later, you guys guest starred on a show, as I recall. On what show? I don't remember. I should have it here, but the research is just not that good. Uh, we did a lot of guest shots together. Yeah. Nice to work with him again all the time? Yeah. I loved him. I miss him very much. Yeah. Funny guy. Very funny. Guy. Very funny and very sweet. Never heard him say a bad word about anybody. Did you keep any memorabilia from, uh, from the Van Dyke show? Oh, I kept everything. <laughs> I kept every script. I had it bound. Each script was bound. I have pictures. I have things from the show, you know. And what is your character? What is Sally Rogers doing today? Sally Rogers was the first woman's liver on TV. She worked with the men. She got the same salary. She was treated as an equal, and she was a single girl. And she was the first woman's liver on TV. Uh, everybody seems to try and get the credit. Mary said she was the first one. She wasn't. Uh, Marlo Thomas said she was the first woman's liver. She wasn't. I was. And uh, I had people come up to me and say, it's because of you that I decided to become a writer. If you can do it, I can do it, you know? Anything we missed? I don't know. We could talk about Gibraltar or something like that. <laughs> I can't think of anything that you've missed except what my daily routine is at home. <laughs> Save that for the next interview. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much. My is pleasure. Cool. I'm teasing, but it was my pleasure. Thanks. And thank you, everyone. Gracious. Funny full of terrific stories that you probably won't hear anywhere else, and recently honored for her lifetime achievement, the legendary Rose Marie. That's it for now. I'm David Levin. You can follow Pop Goes the Culture on Twitter at Pop Go Culture, Facebook, or email me at popgoestheculturetv at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe. I'm here with a new interview every Monday. Thanks for watching. See you next time.